I will open your show. Uh, the first thing that I would like to say is to, uh, to thank you for coming and show some interest uh, about the research I am doing. Um, what I will uh, be presenting today is uh, the conceptualizations of this research, this comparative approach that I have uh, between Quebec and um, the Italian feminist movements. Uh, it's just about uh, what could look like an introduction, an introduction to the book that I will be writing on this. The book is far to be written, but it's on the way with this kind of criminal, criminality thinking. This is a research project that intends to address the challenge once raised by Sheila Robotam concerning a major weakness of feminism and political movements in general which is the tendency to forget important elements of history and the absence of mechanisms for the transfer of memory from one generation of activists to another. She reminds us that feminist movements of the late 60s and the beginning of the 70s in the Western world rejected the sole project of emancipations within modernized capitalism and envisions instead the complete liberations of all forms of oppression. Other critics have also pointed out the recurrent lack of collective memory or the general tendency to rely solely on restrictive theoretical frames when the time comes to assess feminist struggles, its gain and its losses, contributing to the marginalizations of important analytical factors and issues. Some criticize the confiscations of political struggles within political movement many of which are still informed by patriarchal logics, maintaining a multiple invisibilization and gender hierarchies within the many spheres of political activism. Or some highlight the occultations of important feminist theorizations coming out of the 70s and the 80s. Others, while commenting outside feminism, suggested that this lack of memory transfer come from generations of political activists who did not want to leave any heritage of their experience. Whatever it is, this period's the political years surrounding the end of the 60s and 70s, and even until the mid-80s, never ceased to intrigue for the student emergence of political movement, followed by an abrupt fall into so-called massive disillusion. Concerning the Quebec feminist movement, some of the major debates that divided women's collectives for decades were whether, whether or not they should collaborate with state institutions in the attempt to force the adoptions of new policies, reforms, and services adapted to women's needs. The other important area that generated significant and conflicting discussion is the difficulty to integrate within feminist theories, the diversities of experience in, in sexuality and race. Participation, non-participation, and the absence of intersectionality were by, not by far the only major issues that divided even polarized feminism. Initially, such debates were conducted within the much larger ideological context, dominated by arguments against the capitalist and patriarchal state and led by an important number of feminists, along with other political actors, who forcefully argue for the necessity to intervene within the social. Even though the preservation of the autonomy of feminist collectives was the ultimate goal, the most important interlocutor who feminist activists talked to and litigated with was the left the old and the new left, embodied by a whole range of political and social movement unions, as well as parliamentary and extra-parliamentary parties and political groups. As the 70s went by, and as the 80s demonstrated a decline in mass mobilization and an expansion of fem and women's groups in all regions of Quebec society, Similar debates seems to be more and more contained within the limits of the movements itself. Then, for feminist activists, the potential interlocutor and negotiating partner shifted from the left and its diverse ramifications to the state and its multiple layers of public institutions. 
Feminism as a political movement was gone. The women's movement as a social movement had arrived. Activists transformed themselves into women's issues experts and began to play an intermediary role between diverse communities of women and public institutions. It would be too simplistic, however, to reduce the action to that purpose only. Feminist activism remains today a genuine opportunity of political engagements for the resolutions of unfinished women's struggles, as well as for struggles happening within public political spaces shared with other political actors, as the existence of autonomous feminist collectives do not seem problematic as they once were for the sake of the unity of the left. Studying the women's movement solely from its internal dynamic and its contradictory and or stance relations with public and state institutions is too restrictive, as it leaves in the margins of feminism significant and determinant factors in the making of its discourses and social practices. Enlarging the scope to the study of synergies and frictions, dialogues and confrontations between feminism and the old as well as the new left shed a different light on the making of feminism. I choose the Italian feminist movements as a comparable movement to set against the Quebec feminist movements. Two feminisms which have never been compared before, but that could potentially bring new light to the past and present theorizations of issues and modes of organizing. These two movements have many points of similarity. First, there is a synergy operating between feminism and the left, especially the new left. Second, both feminisms attributed significant attentions to similar American and French movements, especially on the use of the consciousness raising method and on their choice of issues such as autonomy, abortion, sexuality, sexual difference, the self, all demands oriented toward the constitutions of a new autonomous political subject. Third, there are similarities in the ways in which Italian and Quebec feminist activists perceive their respective society as being homogenous in terms of race and their representations of whiteness. Indeed, important distinctions are to be made in their approaches to the issues of difference and how they have dealt with or created hierarchies among women. Finally, there are similarities concerning tensions and divisions over participating with public political institutions. This enumeration of similarities does not eliminate important differences. Italian feminists, for instance, went deeper into the theoretical sophistications of sexual difference, as well as of the consciousness-raising modes of inquiry. The place taken by psychoanalysis within feminist collectives Many collectives that resolutely separated their feminist thought and practice away from any involvement with masculine thought had a different depthness and resonance in Italy than in Quebec. Moreover, the role in the new left seemed to have a stronger hold on feminist orientations and choices of political strategies in some segments of the Italian movement Although the demand for autonomy in Quebec was the issue that generated most of the tensions and controversy with leftist groups as well. Marxism as a grand narrative imposed many terms of reference on Italian feminists in the early years, and yet the same hegemonic ideological presence existed in Quebec during the same period. Another element of difference is the apparent influence of another grand narrative, nationalism, which appeared to be lacking in Italy. But such a distinctive absence is relative. While the Quebec nationalist movements may warring third world liberation discourses operated a significant, although not a determinant, influence over in political movements, including feminism, it appeared that Italian feminists developed the discourse of separation from masculine, masculine thought with an astonishing similitude. Comparative analysis has the potential to highlight important but neglected dimensions, able to reveal the complexities of movements, which more often than not 
have been characterized as homogenous. It gives me the opportunity to revisit early research on abortion and the setting up of self, women's self-help clinics in Quebec during that time. Italian feminists theorized and organized around the same issues, abortion, the body, sexuality, setting up of consultory, which is the total justice uh, management uh, health centers, and self-help practices. Reading their texts, documents, articles, books, running through their archives and participating in their events, meeting some of the protagonists of the early days of their movements and visiting their homes within many Italian cities in the north and in the south, allows me to reconsider the way in which women's issues were placed either at the core or in the margins of feminist discursive platform, as well as to replace the history of the abortion struggle within the much broader political context. There is always the risk that a long, arduous, exhausting, but also rewarding feminist fight, such as abortion, becomes too emblematic. As emblematic as the, to the 70s, as the women's suffrage has been to the turn of the 19th century. A sense of victory that can produce the negative effect of reducing the scope of a movement. The depth and richness of feminist aim during the 70s goes, goes much beyond practical gains with a sense of success in competing within the world of men. The demand for liberation, as opposed to simply demanding measures of emancipation for women, set feminist activists in conflict with many leftist groups, which up until then understood the women question solely in terms of accommodating the subaltern condition. The genealogical reconstitution proposed here should help us to avoid a homogeneous and restrictive interpretation of a period where too often the liberal paradigm is called up into it to explain the evolutions of feminism until the present. Why, for instance, should the Quebec women's movement, after intense periods of debate, doubt, and mistrust concerning their presence within institutions, should be portrayed as a participatory movement with public institutions for the implementation of social policies on health, violence, and social services. Why should the Italian women's movement, after years of mass mobilization, be presented as a declining movement during the 80s, only to resurface later as fragmented and completely disconnected with public institutions? The approach adopted here is less about analyzing women's groups in their intermediary positions between communities of women and public institutions than to propose a transversal genealogical analysis. It is less about finding the origins of a movement than to highlight relations of proximity, of synergy, and of ruptures with other social forces which, like feminism, wanted to be at the forefront of political transformation. This is why the questions of political and de ideological influences from the left, as well as the impact Italian and Quebec feminism had in return on several leftist organizations and political party is so central to this study. This is where the primary set of relation lies. Both feminism were shaped by that type of synergy. A genealogy of the political effervescence from the 68 years and throughout the 70s should highlight the dialogical dynamic that existed among movement. A dynamic characterized as much by alliances and solidarities than by conflicts and ruptures over the old political discourse and ideology. Initially, feminist activists had to compose with terms of reference that were not their own before rejecting most but not necessarily all of them. Marxist ideologies and class struggle analysis, nationalism and third world liberation discourses, counterculture and the desire to rupture with the whole ways of doing politics. All these political discursive trends shape in many ways the current features of feminism and the political orientations of the women's movement today. In the next two sections, and the first one is a little bit more longer than the, the last one. So the, in the next two sections, I summarize some elements evolving at the merging and or the
the frontiers of these two movements. These elements are not presented in the orders of importance, but they intermingle with one another in such a way that what seems to be the boundary of one dimension is precisely the point of entry of another. So this is where I explore, you know, the influences, the internal, external influences that the feminists and those two feminisms constitute themselves. Internals within their own movements that can be uh, French and American feminism, but I will start with the external uh, influences, which is external but internal within their own national setting, in Italy with other social forces, and in Quebec the same way. And the end, at the end of the 60s, the quest for autonomy, as well as its meaning, was shared by both feminism and the new left. This quest emerged out of several elements of contestation over the way in which the old left intended to maintain its control over emerging political movements, as well as over the expressions of new subjectivities and desires. In Italy, as in Quebec, that period witnessed the political outburst of student movements and working class youth opposed to paternalism and authoritarianism within the family and the education system, as well as the traditional ways of practicing unionism and traditional politics in the left. In spite of the originality of these political movements, master narratives haunted them. While in Quebec many actors of the new left seem to be ambiguously adhered to some sort of nationalism, it was the PCE, the Italian Communist Party, that was incontestably the point of reference for the Italian, as well as the conf of confrontation on the path of, to overturn the capitalist state. Curiously, this, new, this emerging new left contemptuously opposed the demand of autonomy coming from feminist organizations, as well as the autonomy of the women's self. New leftist activists were also companions with whom feminists shared their lives or went to the movie with, were often the same comrades in struggles who disagree with the ways in which women talked about their lives, their oppression, their sexuality, and so forth. On many occasions, they made their opposition known, not only with harsh words, with the, but with the use of violence as well. Within such confrontational context, feminist notions of autonomy covered two strategies that were sought simultaneously. First, the autonomy of feminist organizations away from any political interference coming from the external forces. And second, personal autonomy for women as political subjects. For a significant portion of the feminist movement, the struggle for autonomy stands against the idea that women should integrate into the masculine sphere in the absence of necessary political, social, cultural transformations. The struggle stands against any attempt to compromise with the organization and or institutions dominated by masculine thought. The feminist quest for autonomy, therefore, were re rephrased differently. The strength of its theorizations makes notions such as the personal is political override the type of autonomy the new left was struggling for. Reading analytical accounts from those who witnessed the political struggles of the 70s and the way in which they were confronted with the women question, it is obvious that the new generations of feminists rejected in any reformist demands for the emancipation of women, which put the hold as much as the new left into a profound ideological and theoretical crisis. That crisis did not come to pass without personal dramas within women's lives. Many Italian feminist activists who contributed to the foundations of many autonomous women's collectives came from the PCE ranks, as well as the ranks of the national organization Unione delle Donne Italiane, UDE, which operated under the control of the Communist Party. Since the end of World War II, this national organization's held demands for daycare, labor rights, and pensions for housewives, and was the model for women's emancipation. It is the nat over the nature of this emancipatory demands, 
that the association went into a deep crisis when caught between the authoritarian hold of the much conservative PCE and the strengths of the new feminist collectives, which propose instead a much more radical model for the complete liberation from the traditional ways of doing politics and from the existing models of, the, of theorizing about oppression. The term double activisms, coined by Italian feminists, characterize best the schizophrenia of being involved within and outside the historical and, uh, and the new left, as well as within the outside the constructions of autonomous feminist collectives, along with new generations of activists. Nonetheless, those who forcefully contested the Marxist traditions had, at the very least, to take the time to decipher the fallacies of Marxist emancipation's project for women. The traditions of Marxism as a theory and as a practice would not be easily discarded by any political movement feminism included. For many, it was impossible to separate women's sexuality from the spheres of economy, politics, and culture during the years, during the periods of the 68 years. It was untakeable not to condemn capitalism without using Marxist terms of reference. The histories of dominance of the communist parties of Canada over affiliated women's associations and similar political resonance in Quebec, seen in countless testimonies of women's communist activists during the, in, before and during World War II. In the 60s, a period when the state introduced economic and social policies seemingly in rupture with past and, and, the, and strangely named the Quiet Revolution, Events of political violence were punctuated by brutal capitalist practices and harsh police repression of independent, independentist groups as well as Marxist feminist organizations inspired by third world liberation movement. Third worldism, socialism, nationalism, and counterculturalism were all ideological discourses diffused by many Quebec publications of that period, such as Parti Pris which was perhaps the most influential periodical of the decade. The dilemma of double activism faced by so many Italian feminist activists as its counterpart within the political lives and dilemmas of many Quebec feminist activists. The Front Libération des Femmes du Québec, for, exa for example, was a type of feminist activism torn between its allegiance to women's liberations and to the struggle for socialism and anti-colonialism. The fact that many segments of feminist, feminism looked towards master narratives, either in support or in negations of their influence over their organizations, is nothing new. But perhaps what is less known, or it needs to be reassessed, are the personal dilemmas of women caught between the two loyalties and sometimes ostracized for this. Many of them quit leftist organizations in great numbers, provoking at times the dissolutions of political groups like Lotta Continua in Italy and En Lutte in Quebec. Many of them continue to claim the importance of remaining connect, connected with political struggles and other social issues. The concept of double activism described this dilemma as lived by those who remained members of gender mixed political groups while helping to create entirely autonomous feminist collectives devoted to the practice of consciousness raising among women only. The influence of American and French feminists came after the political influence of leftist, leftist political groups and movements. This does not mean that international influences have been secondary to the influence from the left. However, it points to the fact that political forces within a given geograph geographical and national context are already entrenched within the social relations of society and provide the broader political context within which feminist movements evolve. In Quebec, as in Italy, feminist activists were deeply implicated within the 68 years, participating in the political and the ideological strengths of the student movement and the anti-authoritarian culture of the time. However, these illusions appear quickly the traditional ways of doing politics, even among the new generations of leftist activists, created the context 
where feminist theories and analysis coming from other countries and dealing with the same difficulties out of their own political effervescence were eagerly sought. Internal, external influences within Italian and Quebec feminism are interrelated and interdependent. American and French feminism enrich and further complicated their multifaceted representations of women as political subject, distinct from their male counterpart. Nonetheless, American and French respective system of feminist thought remain a strange and never erase important and significant difference. The difficulties associated with mediation and or translation get in the way of fundamental issues such as the role of class struggle within feminist social practices, the integrations of race and differences among women, the meaning of the personal and the political, the theorizations of sexual difference, the practice of consciousness raising and the impact of psychoanalysis within the movement, and gender relations in relation with public political institutions. Feminist theorizations of race is always central in feminist theorizations, and especially during that period. Both feminist movements base their social practices and their political discourses on the perception that their respective societies are deeply divided by social classes, but are homogeneous in terms of race. Early radical feminist and materialist theorizations of women's oppression, reproduction, and women's work attempted to engage with Marxist ideological and materialist frames in order to present women as a class. But it is on the terrains of political activism that the situation get more intricate when feminist analysis of social and economic conditions of working class women Yet are mixed with anti-colonialist discourse from third world liberation movements, as was the case in Quebec. We encounter here another porous frontiers of feminism, for which an intersectional and transnational analysis is needed, if we want to decipher the way in which Quebec and Italian feminist activists talk and develop the representations of women's movements elsewhere in the world. Indeed, the more or less acknowledge in the old separate ways that important feminist issues were coming from outside the Western world, but with a very limited potential to enrich their own theoretical and political social practices and political discourse. In doing so, they adopted restrictive representations of women from third world countries at the same time that they described their oppression with very limited views as to how their collective action can contribute in return in understanding their own conditions. Feminist texts, such as those found in feminist periodicals, become primary sources. Articles abound of sophisticated analysis within which the foreign subaltern woman is represented as victim rather than an agent of her own history as object of study rather than participating in the emergence of a new political subject. Indeed, American feminist influences brought to the Italian and Quebec feminist movements the possibilities of referencing and comparing women's condition characterized by whiteness with other situations of oppression such as African Americans, but mainly through a type of representation that marginalize even further black feminist thought and black women's representations of oppression. Then the question of race intersect with class categories must be problematized not because it is more or less part of a formal political discourse of the left or of feminism, but because it remains outside the national fabric and is even, in some cases, essentialized in biological terms. Taking into consideration race and class bring us to the operative meanings of the concept of the subaltern and the subaltern women. Gramsci conceived the subaltern as a position, preserving the potential for subaltern groups to be agents of their own political consciousness. It should not come as a surprise then that many Italian feminist activists, especially those from the South, will use the term not as a descriptor of women's conditions, but as a research and analytical tool in pretty much the same way that the subaltern studies groups will do within the totally different context of India. 
that is to research women's history, not from the position of those who are members of movements and institutional structures, but from where they are located with, in their daily lives. Being reminded of the origin of the concept, concept is also a reminder that the subaltern women is as much characterized by class as by race, that these two positions cannot silence one another. Marxism, then, is not only linked to Italian feminism, just as nationalism is not tied to Quebec feminism only. To separate these two master narratives in order to make Italian and Quebec feminism distinctives, leave as aside the nationalist narratives entrenched within the discourse of the women's self. Already analytical and theoretical connections between feminism and nationalism have produced a rich body of feminist scholarship within diverse contexts. Nationalist discourse intersect with political and methodological practices of starting from one's own experience within small consciousness raising groups, of creating women's only space, of exploring personal experience leading towards the emergence of a new political subject, and so forth. <coughs> In culture and imperialism, Edouard Said, while discussing liberation movements from imperialism, characterized the women's movement as being central to that process, pointing to women's resistance to male practice within the emergence from form of nationalist movements. Said's characterizations of cultures as seeking to liberate themselves from imperialism and colonialism point specifically to contemporary feminism when describing nationalist consciousness. Theorizations of sexual difference, the discoveries of one's own history, language and culture, and so forth, use political tools for an unprecedented liberation of women at the personal as well as the collective levels, which in turn will lead to a radical transformation of society. It should not come as a surprise then that Italian feminist activists use the terms such as separatism pretty much the same way than those who sometimes negatively here characterize the Quebec nationalist movement. Acknowledging the influence of massive narratives is one thing, but attributing to them a determinant position in shaping feminism and political events is another. They can, they can overshadow smaller important ones as well as con contribute to hiding voices of contestation that they bring with them. The strength, the novelties of Quebec nationalism, for instance, the fact that this society was exploring new theories with the modern conceptions of nationalist liberation cannot be explained without smaller narratives. It will make no sense to study Quebec during that period without taking into account the novelties of third world liberation movement discourses and the counterculture movements. Because it was not solely the independence of Quebec that animated the strengths of the movements, but also the desire to transform the way people lived. The education system, the role of the family, the way in which people went to work and or to the market. For women within that movement, the desire was to transform it all and much more, to put an end to patriarchal relations within their lives, to change the way in which women express their sexuality, control their reproduction, even the relationship they have established among themselves. The expressions of new desires and needs, the emergence of new political actors and subjectivities animated their protest. The question remained, though, as to how the dissociations of counterculture from the social and the political spheres of activities happen. How culture and political arts, for instance, were dissociated from political movements, feminism included. This is my final section, which is much shorter than the one that I just uh, concluded. It will also uh, perhaps serve as a, a conclusion in itself. When it, I look at the internal dynamic, uh, what it has produced in terms of fractures within the movement itself, when I was talking, for instance, about the schizophrenia of going for the social or remaining within the borders of the movement itself. In L'Essico Politico delle Donne, Manuela Freire evokes the two souls of feminism, one oriented toward the outside in connection with other political struggles, while the second focuses 
on the development of an entire autonomous movement, away from any political ideological interference and contaminated by masculine thought. The two souls of the movement cut across all feminist movements within the Western world with more or less intensity. In the case of Italy, for instance, the divide within the movement was intensively lived among protagonists and provoked irreconcilable fractures within smaller groups and larger collectives. In Quebec, debates were no less intensive, although these never partitioned the movements completely. The inside-outside dilemma bring us back to the personal schizophrenia lived by activists who are making the movements, as well as the schizophrenia of the movement itself. Such tensions restrain as much as it generates energies. It promotes dialogue and synergies as much as it subjected the movement to irreconcilable divisions among its most valuable forces. And such polarizations did not mean that discourses and social practices within feminism were limited to only point of contentions. Each soul of the movement is in itself multifaceted. Each side had to deal with the multiple senses, meaning, interpretations, attributed to the notions of personal is political, and to other notions such as sexual difference and of liberation, always put in opposition to the concept of emancipation as proposed by the left. Each side has, has to explain its mode of practicing or even proclaiming the end of consciousness raising. This feminist method that came from the US in which continually tainted residual ongoing attachment to certain grand narratives such as Marxism and psychoanalysis. Each side created and managed its own structures and institutions within various layers of society, schools and university, arts and science, work and family, and so forth. The inside-outside schizophrenia opened a multiple cities of situation which forbid a linear understanding of a movement like feminism. I will take an example with the almost hegemonic consciousness raising modes of inquiry. The work of almost every small group or larger collective was based on sharing private lives and personal experiences. It was supposed to lead toward feminist consciousness and the emergence of a new political subject out of the structural, cultural, social conditions of gender relation. All the feminist theoretical work of individualizing private facts of analyzing women's relationship with men, with their mothers, with other women, and so forth, all political attempts to break women's isolations contributed to seeing oneself as a political subject and as an agent of history. Many activists consider the feminist work on women's con unconscious as counting among the great discoveries of feminism and of being the only practice able to reconcile the two axes or the two souls of the movement. Nonetheless, as a discourse as a practice, it was viewed in many different and sometimes opposing ways. While many consider the practice as above all political and as more than just simply psychoanalytical, for others such as the Liberia delle Donne di Milano, which was very popular outside Italy and perhaps emblematic of the Italian feminist movement, the practice had rapidly reached its limits and needed to be sent to the archives of the movement. The Libreria theorizes the issues of difference among women within the parameters of the self, which means that, dif that difference is seen less in terms of race or in even in terms of class or fortune than in terms of values, intellectual upbringing, professional achievement, political affinities and affiliations. These were presented as primary set of difference that should be object, the, object, the object of feminist investigation, especially when conflicts and tensions emerge within feminist collectives. Comparatively, Quebec women's groups' theorizations of the self and their use of the consciousness raising methods give more space to the expressions of differences in terms of class and sexual practice and in, to much lesser extent in terms of race as opposed to different visions of the world of political affinities. By theorizing difference among women through disparities of knowledge and experiences, the Libraria delle Donne comes to occupy a very specific but 
although circumscribed locations within the, the women's movements. But it becomes emblematic of the Italian feminism. A position that will appear particularly disturbing to many readers accustomed to analyzing differences with different marked categories. For the Liberia, a renewed social contract should not come, should not be established between women and men, but between women who want and women who know. It should be understood as the entrustments toward a symbolic mother who knows more in terms of knowledge and experience. This way of theorizing sexual difference become the hub of the inside-outside fracture within the Italian feminism, as well as of the liberation's emancipation debate. The interpretations of the Librea sexual difference disputes any merit to the quest of equality in the world of men. Equality measures that women get within the actual system are ultimately defeatist, as these measures legalize the oppression. The recognitions and application of sexual differences, on the contrary, put the emphasis on releasing and freeing women's ways of being and thinking about the world differently from men's. The liberal theorizations of sexual difference and of differences among women dominate large segments of Italian feminism and makes it unique within the Western world. Even if there were many different diversion interpretations and applications, this type of theorization tainted social practices and the structural making of a movement that fiercely defended its autonomous space within the universal political movements. I will conclude with a very short comment on the place occupied by the politics of women's only spaces within feminism. Such spaces were seen as necessary in order to recompose the links between the personal and the political in front of the impossibility to bring women's issues within masculine organization, even those apparently more open to the introductions of some feminist demands. The creations of women's only spaces is also a process which encompasses several ways with which it is possible to evaluate the evolutions of feminism towards its expansions in all areas of political, economic, social, and cultural Italian and Quebec societies up until the context of the present days of women's movement. The multiplicities of definitions of politics of resistance and, I should add, of the feminist politics, emancipation, liberations needs to be emphasized. The list of demands brought into light by this movement is almost impossible to determine since feminism tackles every spheres of human activity. And in light of this fact, we should consider feminism as a total paradigm. As a political movement, it presents a diversity of positions on the most appropriate organizational forms and strategies to achieve autonomy and control over oneself. The idea of mapping these movements along the lines of its multiplicities of groups, collectives, networks, coalitions, and so forth, at the local, regional, national, and international, transnational levels is a fascinating but unreachable dream since one must always keep in mind the transient experience of many of these experiences even when counting on the traces left in the memories of the activists who brought them to light with the help of existing but scattered archives. And I put the final word right there and open to your comments and questions. I uh, thank you for listening so carefully. Questions? Or? You refer briefly to Gramsci. I know that you went visiting the Institute in Italy. Uh, in Rome. In Rome. Um, nowadays, the Gramsci approach is used a lot in subaltern studies, but was it as prominent at the time? And uh, was it used the same way in Quebec and in Italy? Because in Quebec there was uh, Jean-Marc Piot, who mm -hmm. was a bit of a pioneer, but I don't know if it had a big, big impact. So. I, I will say that the, the, uh, the notions of the subaltern, the way it has been uh, written and approached as such, I found it in the, in the South. In Naples, 
uh, in particular. I did not find a predominance of uh, working with the notions of the subaltern when I went to Rome, and not with the articles I was looking for. That was mainly articles that were published in leftist uh, periodicals, such as uh, Rinascita, uh, that comes to mind. But the notions of the subaltern within the Gramsci, um, you know, the institute in Rome, which is, I think, the largest because there are several Gramsci's institutes throughout Italy. There is one in, in Turin, uh, there is one in Naples, there is just in, in Padua, there are practically many institutes throughout the... Uh, but the, the, the notions of the subaltern, I found it in the south of Italy, not in the north. Especially in Naples. And uh, with the interviews that I conducted with women, you know, this, this notion came uh, a couple of times, and also within texts published in 1980s, uh, I found, you know, the notion of the subaltern, and the way in which looking at the histories of women uh, in that region, in that uh, place, pretty much identical to what we would uh, understand that. Like, it's not a descriptor, it's an analytical tool. Cela fait peut-être quelques, quelques années maintenant que tu t'intéresses, disons, au mouvement italien, le féminisme, n'est-ce pas Oui. J'étais là, disons, quand tu commençais. Et ce qui m'intéressait, c'est de savoir si la, la même chose s'est passée au moment où le féminisme québécois était très fort, n'est-ce pas oui. Et si le féminisme québécois s'intéressait ou même était influencé un peu par le féminisme italien oui, et le mouvement que, oui. Oui. Il y a eu quelques publications à la fin des années 70, par exemple, il y avait euh, euh, Louise Mandelaire, qui était qui est professeure à l'Université euh, du Québec à Montréal, s'est intéressée aux féministes italiens. Et elle a fait sa, sa thèse de doctorat en France, mais par la même occasion, elle a travaillé sur une collection d'articles sur le féminisme italien. Euh, J'ai retrouvé à quelques occasions des articles sur le féminisme canadien, dont une section sur le féminisme québécois. Donc, euh, il y avait déjà à l'époque une conscience de l'existence, euh, certainement de, de la part de certaines féministes euh, québécoises, de l'existence d'une euh, pensée qui circulait au niveau de l'Italie. Et ce qu'il faut voir aussi, c'est que cette connaissance-là existait à l'intérieur de tous les mouvements sociaux québécois, de, le, de la présence d'un de, de, euh, de, de mouvement social italien, d'une gauche italienne, à l'intérieur desquels circulait, bon, à l'intérieur comme à l'extérieur, fonctionnait, euh, je veux dire, de multiples organisations collectives euh, euh, féministes, par exemple. Et, par exemple, quand j'ai parlé de tantôt de la dissociation de euh, l'OTA Continua et en lieu, ces organisations-là se parlaient. Euh, euh, quand j'ai travaillé sur euh, les périodiques québécois, euh, on faisait souvent des recensions sur, euh, sur certaines publications italiennes. À savoir si l'Italie était aussi consciente que les féministes italiennes étaient aussi conscientes, c'est une autre chose. Les féministes qui avaient pu être un peu plus subalternes dans ce sens-là, mais euh, ce sont des mouvements qui se sont, sont développés à peu près à la même période, avec beaucoup de similarités. Ils se sont interrogés sur les mêmes questions. Ils ont trouvé parfois des, 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 des alternatives et des stratégies qui sont similaires. Parfois, ça a été des stratégies qui, ont pu, qui sont un peu différentes. Mais ce sont quand même, c'est quand même deux mouvements qui s'éliminent l'un l'autre. En particulier sur leur relation avec d'autres forces sociales que simplement être à l'intérieur de leur propre, rester enfermé à l'intérieur de leur propre frontière. Et dans les deux cas, il y a une lutte contre le héritage culturel catholique. Dans les deux cas, et ça c'est beaucoup plus fort en Italie. Euh, parce qu'il y a eu des luttes de, de, comme l'avortement, le divorce par exemple en Italie, l'Église catholique s'est impliquée dans, je dirais, une force euh, d'opposition euh, assez euh, très importante, en particulier sur des, deux référendums, l'un contre la loi sur le divorce et un autre contre la loi, la nouvelle loi sur l'avortement. Le catholicisme au Québec, je veux dire l'héritage, c'est plus un héritage qu'une force d'opposition. C'est-à-dire qu'il y a une culture catholique qui imprègne euh, les mentalités, les consciences. 
l'Église catholique a été moins une force de position contre les organisations féministes. Ça ne veut pas dire qu'ils ne l'ont pas exercé, mais ça s'est beaucoup moins senti que dans le cas de l'Italie, et qu'elle se fait sentir encore euh, euh, en Italie. Mais elles se sont mobilisées, et elles ont, ce sont les, les Italiens, par exemple, à travers ces référendums, pour essayer d'abroger la loi sur les divorces, ou sur la loi sur euh, l'avortement, euh, ou le Parti communiste, qui, était très cons qui est très conservateur sur les questions sociales et les questions de famille, c'est plutôt rangé du côté de la position de l'Église sans y être totalement, parce que euh, on estimait que les familles italiennes n'étaient pas encore assez avancées pour accepter des lois semblables. On s'est rendu compte avec les résultats de référendum que les, la société italienne était beaucoup plus avancée. Euh, je veux dire, le, les, la volonté d'abroger ces lois a été battue là, à pratiquement au-delà de 70% dans le monde. Mais vous avez en Italie, par exemple, des forces politiques très fortes, cléricales aussi. Bon, alors, merci à tout le monde pour venir et merci beaucoup à, à Jacinthe pour nous présenter aujourd'hui.